Well, once again, our, our theme, our context for the Gospel of Mark is, is found, I believe, in the very first words of Jesus in chapter 1, where, where he says in verse 15, the kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of God has come. And he begins to demonstrate that by calling and training disciples, by teaching with authority. The, the response to his teaching was always, well, no one has ever taught like this before. He healed the sick. He had power over demonic forces. He even forgave sins, which uh, the Pharisees and the scribes were, well, they were, they were so freaked out by it. They said, no one could do this but God. Who does he think he is? The wind and waves obey his command. He, he raises uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead. He's rejected by his own hometown, his family, his friends. And, and last week he multiplies five loaves and two fish to, to feed over 5,000 people. And so he, here's the scenario. By, by this time here in the Gospel of Mark, the people, the disciples, there should be no doubt in their minds that the kingdom of God has come. It's come in compassion. It's come in authority. It's come in power. It's come in word and deed. The kingdom of God it has come in the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. He's here. I mean, amen. I mean, how, how, what more can he do? And, and so they're, they're, they're watching, they're following, and, and we pick up the story here in chapter 6, verse 45, where it says, immediately, there, there's a sense of, of urgency here, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude, those he just fed, away. And when he sent them away, he decided and departed to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw them straining at rowing, for he, the wind was against them, and it was about the, the fourth watch of the night. He came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking, they supposed it was a ghost. And they cried out. For they all saw him, and they were troubled, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure. And they marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves. Interesting statement, because their heart was hardened. In some way, outside of the fact that Jesus was caring and the fact that Jesus was compassionate to, to feed these throngs of people, thousands, in some way, the feeding of the 5,000 was kind of a failure, kind of a bust, because the people didn't get it. And John, John in, his, in his chapter, speaking on this, he says they immediately tried to force him to be a king, an earthly king. The disciples, it says, we just read in, in verse 52, they didn't understand about the loaves because their heart was hardened. So the crowd nor the disciples get the message Jesus was wanting them to get about this amazing miracle of multiplying fish and loaves. I, don't, no, I mean, immediately he tells them to get in the boat. And we know they had 12 baskets left over, so they're stuck with all these leftovers, and they're in the boat. And Jesus sends the crowd away. He sends the disciples away. Tells them to go to the other side of the lake. I mean, Jesus was, was revealing the kingdom of God has come, that he's the bread of life, that he's, he's the Lord of lords, and they miss the message. So he decides to spend some time alone with the Father, praying, being in his presence, interceding, I'm sure, for the disciples. And, and under Jesus' command, under his approval, 
The disciples are right where Jesus wants them to be, even though, listen, they're, they're in a storm. They had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. And, and in other words, they, they still didn't quite grasp who he was. If he could take a couple of, of fish and some bread and feed thousands, well, he can take care of us in a storm, in a crisis. That's where he sent them. And, and let me just say this to you and to me. No one ever said following Jesus was all smooth sailing. Right? So they're in a storm. And he sent them there. I, I want to just read a passage to you from 2 uh, Timothy. This is the Apostle Paul. And, and he kind of highlights this, this thing of following Jesus is not always easy. He, he says, You therefore, my son, speaking to Timothy, this is Paul, be, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be, be strong in the, the compassion and the love that he has for you. And Jesus has demonstrated uh, his grace and power all through the first six chapters of Mark in powerful ways. And, and then Paul tells Timothy why he needs to be strong in the grace. And he says this, because you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So I want you to remember his grace and his mercy and his compassion and how much he loves you, Timothy, because you're, you're going to have to endure hardship as a good soldier. You, you think about people in the military, soldiers, especially in that time and even in our time. Usually the authority, the government or whoever provides you with a uniform, with equipment, with training, with weapons, but you still have to fight the battle. You know, I have a son-in-law who's, who's a F-18 pilot in, in the Navy, and he's getting ready to go out on a carrier in the Pacific. So I, I just Google us. I wanted to know, how much does an F-18 jet cost? $61 million. <laughs> and they let him basically have this $61, $2 million weapon. But you know what? He's still got to land that thing. He's still got to fight the battle. He's still got to go out there. And even though God gives us, you know, all that we need in Christ Jesus, he's more than sufficient. But we still fight the battle in this fallen world. Be, be, he says, you, even though God's given you amazing grace and you, you can be strong in it, you, you still got to endure hardship like a good soldier. And then he goes on and also says to Timothy, if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And he, he talks about an athlete, and he's specifically talking about uh, runners. He said, even though God's been gracious to you, even though he's given you all that you need and all the righteousness you need to live a godly life here on this earth, you still got to run the race. And you still got to run it according to the rules, according to, to, to God's boundaries in your life. Just don't do whatever you want to do. So, so there's this grace, there's this compassion, there's this amazing love of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he still says, hey, you're going to fight a battle, you're going to run the race, and you've got to persevere, you've got to stay in the race. And then he goes on to even use another analogy for Timothy. He said, the hard-working farmer. And I, 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 I'm not a farmer, but I have a yard. <laughs> and I live in Florida. And if you have a yard and you live in Florida, and it's 100 degrees outside, and you've been gone for a couple weeks, and all the, I don't know if you have this weird, call it, I don't know what they call this kind of grass that grows straight up through all your bushes. You come home and you're like, what in the world happened? So you go out the next day and you're trying to pull all this and, it, and you're, you're a little older than you used to be and you're about to pass out. You're thinking, what, what's it like for a farmer? 
You know, it, it, it's, it's plowing, but, but God, gives, God gives sun, he gives rain, he gives, he gives the earth, he gives the seed. But you know what? The farmer still has to plow and plant and, and weed and fertilize and harvest, and it's hard, hard work. Paul was, was thrown in prison. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. He was misunderstood. And Jesus has these, these disciples and all these people that he's feeding, and, and he's, he's teaching them a message. Say, so, hey, guys, watch me feed over 5,000 people with just a couple fish and bread. I'm able to meet your needs. I'm able to do what no man can do with power, with authority, with compassion. The, the kingdom of God has come. And sometimes God lets us come to the end of our own resources to get our attention and to show his grace and power. Jesus is up there praying. In verse 46, he sent them away. And the evening came. The boat was in the middle of the sea. He's alone in the land. And he saw them rowing, for the wind was against them, and it was the fourth watch at night when he came to them. Now, I don't know how he saw them in, in the dark. Was it a miraculous kind of thing? He sees the men struggling. It's late in the evening. And I'm sure, once again, Jesus is, because he always is, he's moved with compassion. And it seems like he lets them struggle all night. He comes to them on the fourth watch, which is around anywhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. And, and I'm sure they're frustrated, they're tired, they're rowing all night. But these guys are tough. They, they know the lake. They know how to get to the other side. And it's about six hours or more they're, they're, they're rowing against the wind and against the storm. In the fourth watch, they, they, they've gone nowhere. They, they're right where they started almost. No progress, out of gas, out of strength. Pretty panicked, fearing the storm. And all self-confidence, I think, at this point is starting to disappear. Like, maybe we can't do this. And the disciples, it seems, need another lesson of who Jesus is, of his authority. And to confirm again that, that the kingdom of God has come, that it's centered in the person of Jesus Christ. So, so Jesus decides the time is, is, is right. And he comes walking across the water, in the dark, wind and waves, moving towards the exhausted disciples. And he sees them straining. And when they saw him, verse 49, they cried out, it's a ghost. I'm sure they did. No one's ever seen anybody walking on water. If you were out in the middle of a storm and you saw a figure coming through the dark and the, the, the rain and the wind, you, you would probably say the same thing. Is, it, what, is that a ghost? They've never seen anything like this before. And, and as a side note, let me just say this. There was another time, and we've, we've gone through this scenario already, when they were in a storm and Jesus was in the boat sleeping. Remember that? And, and they woke him up. They were still afraid. Now this time he's not in the boat. And they're super afraid. And it's, a, it's kind of a great picture, I think, of our time and our life. Once Jesus was here on earth. Kind of in the boat here, so to speak. Well, now, 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 however, he, he's in heaven interceding for us, kind of like he was standing on the, on the mountain and there in the storm. And, and I, would, I would say that you and I and the culture and the world that we live in right now, we're, we're kind of in a dark storm. I could read all kinds of statistics about suicide and drug abuse, and, and, and we could go on and on about, you know, the digitizing of money and one world order and all of that. And I could say to you, hey, you know what? 
We're in a storm, a dark storm, here in our country and here in our world. And, and he's in heaven interceding. But one day, like here, he's coming back. He's going to walk into the midst of our storm, just like he did in this storm. And he will return, and he'll still the storm. Isn't that awesome? Amen. He's coming back. There's a picture somewhat of that here. And, and here's the disciples. You know, Jesus is, is coming to them. They think he's a ghost. They almost miss it. They're so caught up in the fear of the storm. And, and they see this figure on the water. And they all see a ghost. I mean, you would think if you're in that boat, picture yourself in the boat. The storm's enough, right? You don't need a ghost. Now you got a ghost. An evil spirit hovering over the water. And Jesus speaks up. Be of good cheer. It's I. Don't, don't be afraid. Be better translated, I think, hey, have courage. It's me. And they're right where Jesus asked them to be. And Jesus is now there with them. And I think one of the greatest miracles of all is, is that he's with us. Wherever we go, whatever we do, it's always great to remember. He says, I'm with you. Have courage. Don't be afraid. Don't ever forget that, that he's with you. That he says, have courage. Don't be afraid. The actual command is, stop being fearful. And he went up into the boat to them, and the wind stopped. They were greatly amazed and beyond measure and marveled. And, and Jesus, he had said, it is I. In, in the Greek, it simply means, I am. It's the same words that the Lord spoke to Moses and his crazy experience with the burning bush. You know, Moses saw something weird, not a ghost, but he saw a bush that was burning and didn't consume itself. And, and God told Moses, I am is going to send you. It was kind of Moses' storm in the wilderness of being a, 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 a you know, a, a a shepherd and, and at one time at the peak of his career and now living out in the wilderness and the great I am speaks to him. And Jesus not only bears the name of God, the kingdom of God has come. They don't seem to really comprehend who Jesus is. Moses needed to know. It's kind of like this. See if I can illustrate this. Let's say you and I started a church basketball team. And we're trying to get people to play, and a guy walks in, and, and nobody knows who he is. This guy must be new. He's tall. That's a good thing for a basketball player. And someone says, hey, bro, can you play? He goes, yeah, I can play a bit. Can, can you dribble okay? Yeah, can you shoot? Yeah. You're, you're kind of tall. Can, can you jump? Can you dunk? Yeah, I can dunk. I'm not talking donuts. I mean, can you dunk this basketball? Yeah, I can dunk it. So, so he shows up for the first practice game. You're at the gym. You don't really know if he can play or not. So, so we'll find out. So he shows up. But this, some, but this time someone recognizes him and says, do you know that's LeBron James? Who? Le LeBron James. And no one asks him, can you dribble? Can you jump? Or can you dunk? Because they know who he is. And if you know who he is, you know what he can do. And Jesus shows up and says, I am. And if you know who he is, you know what he can do. And so he identifies who he is. He uses that amazing term, I am. And whatever you are going through, 
If you really, 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 listen, know who he is, you can trust that he knows what to do. Because he shows up at the game all the time. He's always faithful to show up. Shadrach, Meshach, and one bad amigo knew he would show up. <laughs> Daniel in the lion's den knew who he was. Moses at the Red Sea knew who he was. And Paul and Silas trapped in the Philippian jail, chained in the inner courts of it, began to worship at night because they knew who he was. We know who he is. And they just began to worship. Listen, storms come into everybody's life. Nobody's exempt. They come in relationships. They come in finances. They come in health. They come with your kids. If you have kids that are teenage or beyond, you know what a storm is. They come in pandemics. They come in politics. They, they come in literal storms like hurricanes. And sometimes it feels like you're way blown off course to where you want to go or where you think you're supposed to be. The disciples, they, 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 their heart had, had been hardened because they didn't really realize who he was. In, in, in verse 53, they had crossed over and came to the land of Gennesaret, and they anchored there. I, I, I pulled up a little map, if we, if we have it. There's the feeding of the 5,000. He, he was sending them to Bethsaida up above, and, and they end up over here to, in Gennesaret, way, way blown off of, of course. From the west side of Galilee, headed for Bethsaida on the northeast, they are now on the south, southwestern shore of the lake. And Jesus steps off the boat, and immediately the people recognized him. Jesus is like Tom Cruise on steroids. <laughs> Wherever he goes, they know who he is. His popularity and fame ha has grown so much that he can't go anywhere. And now the town is just buzzing with, with the news. People recognize him. It ran through the whole surrounding region People around, they didn't have, you know, television or radio. There's no one in that. But around the town well, over fences and, and local stores and shops and backyards, the whole region is buzzing. Hey, guess who's in town? Jesus. And so, so what do they do? They're bringing the sick. They're carrying them on beds and those, wherever they heard he was and Wherever he entered villages, cities, or countries, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that he might just touch them, the hem of his garment, and as many as touched him were made well. The whole region's talking about his popularity, and they're just packing the streets. Be like, you know, like trying to get down Highway 98 at 5 p.m. heading towards Navarre nightmare. It's just so crowded. And, and it's not just normal crowds. This is all sick people. They're being carried. They're being pushed. They're being pulled. And, and they're all filled with the same hope. You know, I can be made whole. I mean, Jesus, the teacher, Jesus, the one who could raise dead, Jesus, who, who preached Repentance and belief. Jesus who cast out demons. Jesus who fed multitudes. But most of the crowds knew him as a healer. His true mission was to save and preach the kingdom of God. But he's also so filled with compassion. So they filled the marketplace with the sea. It's like a giant open clinic. And there Jesus is. You can imagine. And it tells us whenever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, 
They constantly laid the sick in the marketplace and they begged him that he might just touch the hem of his garment. What, what, this, this, this chapter 6, as it, as it comes to, to a close, one thing you see is he, he guides us with his plan. And sometimes it's through a storm. But he says, I am. I'm with you. And he reminds us that following Jesus isn't for wimps. It's for people who are serious. He, he, he intercedes for us in prayer, just like he did the disciples. He's up there on the hillside, and he's watching. He's aware. He, he knows the struggle, but he, he, he sometimes puts you in those situations to, to bring you to the end of your own resources so that you might once again know who he really is. And he always comes to us in the midst of the storm. He reveals to us again and again who he is. And he can be sought out by those who have real need. And he makes whole those who believe. That's part of the scenario here. That's, that's part of what's being shared with us and what we're able to see here in Mark chapter 6. Jesus in his own words, is, is demonstrating and revealing, I am, and also that the kingdom of God is now, it's come. And because of who he is, this sinless man-God, God-man, he offers spiritual healing. That, that's the greatest healing of all. That's the primary purpose for which he came, to be a sacrifice for our sin to be the Lamb of God. See, our greatest storm is a spiritual storm. To be without Christ is to be lost at sea forever. You're always in a storm, a spiritual storm. To, to be without a Savior, to be lost. Talk about being lost and not knowing if you're going to make it through. You don't make it through without Jesus Christ spiritually. You don't. So there's this wonderful story here if you want to draw the parallel. That's why he went to the cross. That we could be saved, that we could be rescued from this storm of sin, this storm of, uh, of self. You know, I, I ran into a guy yesterday, and I don't, I don't know if he's a, a believer or not. And he recognized me, and I recognized him from surfing and he goes hey I want to introduce you to someone it's okay and he had a bunch of kids with him and he said this is uh, Brad English's granddaughter I said oh my gosh Brad, Brad was one of my best friends growing up he actually lived in our home for a while because his mom moved to Huntsville Alabama and we were probably 15, 14. We begged and talked my mom, a single parent, letting another person move in our home. She did it. And, and Brad passed away about a year and a half ago with, with dementia. Great friend. We, we spent lots and lots of times together. We played city football together. We surfed together. We traveled together. Probably one of my closest friends growing up as a teenager. I did his memorial service on the beach. But Brad never really gave his life to the Lord. And I saw his little granddaughter and I thought, she looks just like him. Stocky little blonde hair thing. And it just reminded me again. And, and I watched Brad go through his life and, and you know, I, I thought to myself, without Christ, I would have been very similar to Brad. Lost at sea in a lot of ways. And I'm so grateful that Jesus comes, and he's no respecter of persons. Whosoever will may come, right? Isn't that amazing? You don't have to be a certain, you know, financial class or in any kind of certain, you know, group. Jesus opens the door wide as possible and says, whosoever will may come, but you know what? He says, there are going to be some storms. Not always easy following me. You have to say no to this and yes to that. 
You're going to have to be, you know, like a good soldier and get in that spiritual battle and put your armor on and follow me. You're going to be like a, like a runner. You're going to have boundaries in your life and guidelines, and I'm going to give you wisdom and direction. And like a hard farmer, you're going to, you're going to plant seed, and I'm going to give water in the increase. And, and in the midst of the storm, I'll always be there because I'm the great I am. And if you know who I am, you know what I can do. And I would pray and hope that today you know who he is and that you know what he can do. Because here's the deal. The kingdom of God has come in the person and in the wonderful, amazing presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.